Again, good afternoon. Um, I am absolutely honored uh, to be here this afternoon. And uh, I was talking with uh, some of the Oklahoma State people yesterday, and they were kind of quizzing me of what preparations I had uh, in coming down here and, and how this all came about. I, well, I'm here because Kenneth told me to, <laughs> and, so he, and he gave me a date, so that's why, how I'm here. Uh, I, I think I need to, to give a little bit of, of explanation. When uh, a lot of the, the pieces that I've written, Rabobank has, uh, is my employer, and uh, it's the largest ag bank in the world. But opposed to a conventional advertising program, there's a team of, of 80 analysts globally uh, covering a whole gamut of commodities, and uh, they have us write these research pieces. And uh, I'm challenged, we, we do our fair share of, of conventional price outlook, uh, market outlook kind of stuff, but I'm regularly challenged to write think pieces that will benefit the customers, uh, say, generate a lot of conversation throughout the industry. Um, so when you see me with some, some of these topics that I've covered and talk about, at least now you have a little bit of explanation of who is that lunatic and why is he doing what he's doing. Okay, en enough of that. So a year ago, I, uh, and, and one of my core responsibilities is I'll have a publication piece uh, that will be released in, in the same timing as NCBA. And that's just, it's expected that I, I'll be there. So <clears throat> last year I wrote the piece on, on confined cows. Now I'm going to tell you what, I, I'm seldom in a room that I know as many people as I know here today, so it, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come clean. Absolute true confessions. When I was looking at a topic for a year ago, I had been watching the confined cow piece. I thought it was an interesting topic. I thought it was an area that the industry needed to pursue. But I can tell you that I was looking for a topic that was so far removed from ground beef that I would have <laughs> absolutely no questions uh, on ground beef. So with, with that explanation, that's how um, I got started on the, on the piece that uh, I'm going to talk about today. And then I'm going to finish up with uh, we, uh, Sterling Liddell, is a, uh, my coworker in St. Louis, and uh, we collaborated on a piece uh, talking about uh, agri diversification in row crop farming and the, uh, and the expansion of, of the cow herd that, that we published here a few months ago. So, I'm, I'm kind of uh, using the two reports together. So I hope this is, uh, I hope you, this room's deep enough. I hope you can see the, see the slide, but you know, conventional year over year, uh, when we get to a period of expansion in the industry, uh, the average is 2%. I mean, you, and you can slice it and dice it. And if you go all the way back there to those way, way aggressive years uh, back there in, in the 70s, there were some extremes of some 4 and 5% year-over-year uh, cow herd expansion, but nothing, nothing like that in recent times. So when, when we started on this project, really what we were looking to do was if we could justify rebuilding U.S. cow numbers basically back to the 2007-2008 level. So from the 29 million head low we had in 2014, if we could add between three and four million, put us back to 33 to 34 million uh, cows. And, and the reason that we were doing that, we thought, okay, that size of cow herd would give us a foundation that would be stable enough to supply a, a, a good supply of feeder cattle into our, our cattle feeding network and it would supply an available supply of fed cattle that we would uh, certainly reduce the risk of losing any more beef processing plants. That was, that was a lot of our objective. Okay, we come into uh, 
through last year, we got to the, uh, the mid-year inventory report, uh, cow numbers in July, and you know, that July cattle inventory report, it's just, it's a small sample size, there's no state data in it, it's difficult to work with, but we had an increase in beef cow numbers of, of 3%, uh, up from that 2% I talked about, and we had uh, beef replacement heifers up 7%. Now, I'll talk about it later on. Um, I, when, when I first did this work, I was thinking about a real orderly 2 2.5%, maybe 3% year-over-year expansion and a real orderly thing, and it simply doesn't work that way. Um, we have... You know, the, the, the annual returns per cow-calf of $500 that we had a year ago and where we've been at earlier this year, um, when that signal goes to producers that it, and, and Mother Nature cooperates, it's, it's just a, a land rush to, to get in there as quickly as possible. And I think that's probably what we'll see again this time. So if we need, if we're looking to build, build a 33, 34 million. Now, one of the things that I didn't, incorporate when I wrote the, the, the first piece was, but what about those dairy calves? Now we've got a, a dairy herd of roughly 9.4 million um, and just, you know, simple math would take a reasonable death loss out of that and 9 million, half of it's four and a half male calves that had fully been incorporated into our cattle feeding system. So since the last time that we actually had true expansion in the beef cow herd, not only have we incorporated those dairy male calves into our feed yard network and our, and our conventional beef network, but we have disassembled, for all practical purposes, calf and veal slaughter. So when we talk about this need for increase in, in beef cows singularly, um, we need to be given some attention because there, there's a supply of calves there that we have folded into the network um, that, that we often don't talk about. All right, <clears throat> the barriers to entry. Uh, clearly, uh, the capital requirements. Now, you know, and I don't care where you're at in the country and if, if, if ground, pasture ground is selling from, from 3,000 an acre to up in the Corn Belt, and it's 11,000 plus, and 20,000 uh, top on some row crop ground. It just, if you take somebody that is not in the industry today, uh, the capital requirements to buy, the, buy or lease the ground, and plus cow prices, and at that time from the 2,500 to $3,000 range, uh, it was just prohibitive to entry. So, what, what alternative methods could we use uh, to, to make that more opportunistic for people wanting to enter the industry? Um, decline in grazing acres, and I'll, and I'll talk about that here in a second, but uh, one of the biggest surprises that I had that I'll show here is going from um, the census of agriculture that we've seen a net decline in total grazable acres. So if we're trying to expand this cow herd, but there are fewer acres out there, and that fewer acres is due to expanded row crop acres, that's due to urban sprawl, um, that's due to constraints on public land, BLM ground, um, because of all the environmental issues. So that's a barrier. <clears throat> the third thing that we talked some about was just the demographics, and you know, the average uh, U.S. producer, I think, is 57, 58 years of age, and uh, that data gets pretty ragged if you go out there, but evidence shows that the average cow herd owner is even older than that, and somewhere in the early 60s. So when you take a cow that sat there, something between $1,000 and $1,200 for a lot of years, and you got a guy that's looking for a retirement, that was the window of opportunity, exit opportunity for a lot of guys. So not only were we replacing everything else, but there's a certain demographics that uh, we've had to 
compensate for as well. All right, here's the, uh, here's the slide I was talking about with the reduction in, in total pasture acres. And I got a, a probably of all of the things that came out of that report and, and hot button issues within industry and, and even segments of the media, this slide got a lot of attention. And I'm telling you, I went directly to the Census of Agriculture. There's, there's no hidden numbers here. Now, what surprised me was that if you look there, we had actually seen some increase in permanent pasture ground. And I had to think about that one for a while. And, and <clears throat> you know, I'm not always really, really quick to pick up the phone and talk to the uh, ERS guys in Washington because sometimes I hang up those calls more confused than I was when I called. So I kind of tried to go on this one. But I think a lot of what we're looking at here is simply uh, the number of CRP acres that have gone out of contract, haven't been gone back into uh, into tillable ground, I think that's where that's coming from. You can see with the orange area in there, um, pasture or wooded pastures, that's about as stable as you can get. And then the real decline has been in pasture land or cropland used for pasture. And you think about that, that decline in cow numbers, number one, but you take the 10-year the period that this, this slide covers, and we took uh, corn and soybean prices to all-time record highs, you didn't want to be grazing that stuff. And you take the, the hay acres that we've lost, you take wheat acres, the changes in, in wheat pasture grazing that we've seen over that time. So you can see why those uh, cropland acres have been reduced. Now, I actually, I actually take that as a little bit optimistic because if the economics change as we're implying that they can or will, um, that's one area that we can go back and, and dual use more of those acres than what we've done over the last 10 years. Okay, <clears throat> this, this slide is... Uh, I, I, I borrowed it straight from Jim Robb at the Livestock Market Information Center, but you had, uh, had annual cow-calf returns last year in excess of $500. Um, certainly in this year through the first half of the year and, and even to the, until just a, the handful of weeks ago, um, we were looking at, at that or better for this year without question that economic signal to expand numbers was given to producers. <laughs> it, you know, you take, a, you take an industry that never or seldom averaged over $100 a head uh, total return in the best of years, and now suddenly you're on top of $500, um, somebody is going to respond. And, so, and they're going to respond in conventional uh, rangeland pasture uh, expansion, and they're going to expand with uh, some kind of confined or semi-confined programs. Now, you know, are we going to stay at $500 a head? Not even close. You know, not even close. But at the same time, do, do we expect to go back to anything in this his, historical uh, line, we don't think we'll see that either. So what we're looking for is, is probably see those returns, something in the, the 200, 250, basically, let's just call it a 50% uh, retracement of that whole thing, but still very, very solid uh, income opportunities when based against a historical comparison. So we looked, I got to looking at the confinement models, and I basically looked at, uh, at two different kinds of production. And I, talked, I looked at just simply ex expanding uh, or, or taking cows and putting them in conventional uh, North Plains feed yards. 
and and we you know I I'm, I've talked I've interviewed folks from from Central Texas uh, all the way up in through Nebraska that that's converted conventional feed yards and and while I, I'll tell you a lot of stories it I think it's a very solid solid program and then we talked about the confinement and semi-confinement buildings and when you go to the, those two you know we're talking uh, the the expense of a of a linear slant and a and a pitted structure or a hoop building with a solid floor and and a substantially lower entry cost now i'm going to tell you my own takeaway of this um, kenneth kenneth mentioned it with his intro there in 2011 and 2012 was, were some of the years that I was at, uh, at TCFA and the, uh, the, the drought situation was incre inc incredible. Uh, I, thought it, I thought it was, I, I would say it's the worst I've ever seen, but I've spent time in Australia each of the last three years and, and that situation even makes the Panhandle deal look tolerable. But, you know, so we were out of necessity, as has already been mentioned, we were putting those cows in the feed yard, essentially just to hold them initially, and then, then it expanded into, well, what if we just leave them there? Okay. And then on the confinement buildings and the difference between the linear slant buildings and the, and the, uh, the hoop barns. And I'm going to tell you straight up. First off, as I researched, I found, as I said before, I found this an incredibly interesting topic, but it's one of the things, the more research I did on this area, the more convinced I became this deal will work. Um, and to the point that, you know, I know I don't really look at by age, but, but I'm kind of getting to that point where maybe I don't want to do the dog and pony circuit for the rest of my life, and if I want to do something different, um, this is something I would look at doing myself. So, with that being said, if it, on the confined building side, if I wanted to center my operation on cattle feeding, I would probably opt for the expense of a linear slant building. If I were centering my operation, if I were a row crop farmer and centering my cattle operation with confined cows and the, and the cost, cost difference between the two, the versatility of the two, I believe I'd do, with cows I'd do the, the hoop and with cattle feeding I'd probably do the linear slant. And, and both are interchangeable. Okay, I'm, there's nothing I hate worse than going over um, these spreadsheets to a group. All I really want to cover here is that this is the, the, the comparisons that we did in the study for, for my cow-calf confinement piece, and we took conventional South Plains cow-calf operations, a conventional North Plains cow-calf operation, and you know, since the, since the beginning of time, there's that ongoing argument of, of who's the most efficient uh, cow region, either the, the northern states or the southern states, and I didn't want to get bogged down in that argument. Uh, so we just put them both out there, and you can take your pick. And then North Plains semi-confined, uh, a confinement older operation with an older cow, and a, a confinement operation with a younger cow. And, the, so you can go down through all the, the simple math, but here's our cost per head, and, and then for 100 cows exposed, and our, our number of, of calves, live calves on the ground, and, and we, bumped, we bumped that number of calves um, per, per 100 in the confined units, and we did it simply because the ability to take a broken mouth cow, and a cow that would no longer be efficient in the open environment, and get her in there. Most of those confinement rations are a combination of, of, of uh, distiller's products and, and, and silage. And so it's a soft enough feed that you can, can uh, carry that cow along a ways. So our calf, so then you take uh, down to calf cost, and 
break even for a 550 pound calf. So essentially with all of these operations, we had a variance of a 230 on the North Plains uh, break even for a five, 550 weight calf and our cheapest was the older cow uh, at 204. But with that much variation in production practices and to have a cost of gain within 25 cents a hundred of each other, I thought that was pretty doggone amazing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then I had the, I had the problem of What's a calf going to be worth in the, in the future? And, and when, I, when I wrote the piece last November, December, say, you know, we were right there. Um, did we really think that, I mean, there was no evidence at that time that the rally was going to stop anytime soon. Well, you had to wonder. And then if we correct, how far could it go? So. You know, basically we're talking, uh, if, you, if you take the, the prices I have updated, and, and this is uh, Oklahoma City, uh, four to five weight steer calves as of last week. Not this week's sale, but last week. And you can see from, from this low point to the high, uh, we're, we're right at a 38% correction. Uh, we have, as, as volatile as this market has been in recent weeks, from where it got to, it's still within the confines of what we think are, should be the rules, you know? So I, here's where I'm at. I think that, you know, probably thinking that we would stay up there at three bucks and greater is probably a little overly optimistic. Um, if we do the 50% retracement and kind of back in that uh, 250 to maybe 275 level, and, and in a worst case scenario, uh, and if we totally go back to the breakout point, uh, we'd be talking back to, uh, to two dollars to two and a quarter. And, and the takeaway from that was that if you just take the weight times the price, at the high end of that, you had uh, returns per cow uh, between six and, and seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars a head. Uh, the mid-range returns of 250 to 200, 220 to 250, 260. I think that's a realistic assumption still today. And then here's what I liked about this thing. Even if we go back to the, what we're considering the base price, um, yeah, there's some, there some instances where some of these cattle are gonna lose some money. But it's, a, for, it's not gonna cost anybody a farm. You know, it's not going to take the paint off some, some deal, even under the worst case scenario. Um, so, I thought, yeah. Okay, one last point and I'm going to move on. I talked about uh, the, the fact that we added a couple of calves over the lifetime of the cow for uh, the confined and semi-confined cows simply because we could uh, carry her out a, a, another couple of years. I really believe the takeaway, one of the key takeaways from this, if a guy's gonna do a confined or semi-confined program, it's, it's awful attractive to go buy a flashy set of young cows or heifers and get them stable, you know, get them calved out and stabilized and I've got a set of cows here that I'm gonna stay with for the next six, seven, eight years, where in reality, with that program, the, the guy that's willing to do the additional work and buy a lot of those older cows and have a lot of return over, so you're gonna have to constantly be shopping for what you're gonna replace her with, but that's the highest return um, to extending years off of a cow that, that, that was no longer viable for somebody else. That's, that's a real benefit here. Okay, so what makes this model work? say the, the limit feeding and the ability to um, a, working with nutritionists and the ability to adjust that cow's ration by trimester and post-pregnancy nutritional needs, the stability, your limit feeding, but the stability of the nutritional profile of that cow is constant and the benefits that that 
it puts into the prenatal and postnatal health of that calf really pays dividends. Um, I, uh, I talk one day with uh, a, a group that, that has, has done as much of the confined deal as anybody, and he read the report, and we were talking about it, and he said, Don, and all in all, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. He says, there's a couple of points you probably should know. He says, when those cows start calving, he said, for 10 days or two weeks, you're really, really busy. You're really busy. But he says, Don, if you get two weeks under those calves, you can't kill them with a pickaxe. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. Um, but you talk about the stability of that calf, and now take a conventional raised calf, and the most disruptive period in that calf's life is that period when we take them from the ranch environment, wean them, slam them in a feed yard, and expect them to immediately go drink and, and eat out of a buck. And, and these calves, that's home. That they start eating at a, at a very early age, and they're totally adapted to the confined environment. They're, they're totally bunk broke to, to feed and water. So there's, I've, heard, I've, I've been told that there's as much as $75 a head in, the, in just the lack, lack of disruption that that animal goes through if you're gonna, if you're gonna feed them. Okay, the, the cow health thing that uh, we've already talked about Provides income enhancement to allow young family members to return to the farm. And, and this is one of the things that I personally found so attractive out of this program. We all know the number of calls that I get or anybody in, 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 my, in the consulting in the business is a conventional farmer rancher has a kid Grows up, goes to school, gets a job off farm, five, ten years go by, said, man, dad, I'd really like to come home. But the ability to suddenly pull two households of incomes out of that operation, it's just not there. Uh, now, we've seen, we've worked through that problem some with the, with the hog confinement deal, and, and you can make the argument that, okay, we're just doing that here, but I really see this as a way with a landlocked conventional row crop farm as a means to have income generation to bring kids back to the farm. And I think that's a real benefit to this whole thing. All right, so I talked early on about, and I'm, I'm, I'm switching over here to, the, to our later report and, and, I, and I'll wrap this up, but th this model is Sterling's model and, and I'll be straight up with, you know, Sterling is, is an old uh, FAPRI guy. Um, he's, he's working a model in our office that is very, very sim similar to a FAPRI model. And after we had a chance to run this through, you can see through the model um, just what I was talking about with, while, while I wanted to have this really neat little stair-step growth in annual cow numbers in the way it works. We're gonna front end load this thing in the next two year to two years. And then from that point forward, uh, it, wherever we're going with recovery, uh, it's, we're gonna see the bulk of it in numbers. Um, and then it, it will flatten out in the later years. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the corn market and why this is important to this topic. Here's US annual corn production. We're in here with, uh, you know, we, we've increased, we use a lot of corn, but we've created this huge crop uh, to accommodate our export scene, to accommodate the ethanol programs, and to, uh, to supply our, our feed needs. So that doesn't go away. Once that, once that machine is created to see that many acres of corn and beans, that's not going to change rapidly. So, with you know, and there are going to be drought years. I, I'm not talking a drought year, but for long-term trend lines is what I'm saying here. 
These corn numbers are not going to go down, and they're going to continue to get bigger. All right, ethanol. Because of the RFS, uh, <clears throat> the mandate, renewable fuels mandate, um, we had to build that thing up to where we were using about 14 to 15 billion gallons of ethanol a year, and, and that was using roughly um, 5 billion bushels of corn. But we've reached, the, the point here is you can see the blue lines of how we've ramped up that uh, ethanol mandated level. You can see the, the green line there that the increase in production simply met uh, the RFS mandate, but then you can take the blend wall. Two things happened from when the RFS was employed. We had the Great Recession that consumers were driving less, and we continuously roll over our car fleet with newer and newer cars that have higher efficiency. We're using less in total energy. The ethanol deal is cat and, and less. Unless we were to see a deal where they went to an E15 or an E85 or an open blend, if, we, if we're capped at a 10% ethanol blend, we've got all the corn in the system we need, we got, it's, it's just flatlined, okay. This chart amazed me. And the chart on the left is 1990 to 91. And you can see the blue area that the share of world corn exports that were controlled by the United States. And you can see the, the rest of the world, and you can see Argentina, and Ukraine was just starting to surface. Brazil wasn't doing the second crop thing yet. Now, look at, this one came out of the uh, S&D, or the, the WASD report just the other day. The United States share has shrunk from about an 80, 85% share of global corn exports to about a third. And you've had that growth in there with, say, the Argentine, Brazil, and the growth of their second crop corn, and the Ukraine and the whole Black Sea area. Now, do I think that the U.S. with price will become more competitive and, and battle to take back market share for ex grain exports? Yeah, that makes sense. But again, you've built, the, the, world, the rest of the world has built this global infrastructure that they're not gonna roll over and play dead. The takeaway, ethanol usage is capped. Uh, we've hit the blend wall. Exports are a, are a third of half of what they were um, years ago. We've got a lot more corn on hand to deal with domestically than what we've had for years. And that availability of feedstuffs, whether that be corn as, as ground feed or whether that be corn byproducts of distiller's products or corn stalks, um, corn silage, all of those byproducts, we're going to have a lot more of them for the foreseeable future and that's going to be that feed supply to expand these cattle numbers. That's the whole point I wanted to make with that. Okay, I got one more slide here, I'm gonna wrap this up. So when we did this diversification thing and thinking that Corn Belt farmers are going to need, we need to, to diversify, we spent, we spent almost 30 to, you know, 35, 40 years with all of the university guys and all of us industry guys telling farmers, you got to specialize, you know, you got to focus on what your sector, and now we're turning right around and telling them just the dead opposite. He said, oh, you're too good, you're too good to specialize. There's no money in row crops, you gotta diversify. We're doing a 180. So we're, we looked at the deal and where do we think the cow numbers can expand between now and 2020? And, and, and we baselined at 29 million cows in the 2014 number, the 29 million six or whatever it was. So <clears throat> where we're expecting the growth, clearly Kenneth, Kenneth talked about it in his intro of just how 
fast that rejuvenation can be in Union County, New Mexico, but, but the rejuvenation in the whole South Plains area, um, we think that the easiest repopulation to be will that existing ranch structure that is underutilized or not utilized, and you just simply pull the truck out there and turn some cows out, you know, and you're back in business. They'll go first. The, the West Coast, the drought situation, um, but you take the environmental constraints, you take the population constraints, uh, again, BLM constraints, we simply, even with the El Nino uh, effect this winter, we do not think in the next five years that we will be restoring cow numbers, or ever again, restoring cow numbers in the true West Coast as what they've been before. The Mountain West, we're looking for a 5% increase in cow numbers. But here's the thing there. When, when the severe drought took place here in, in Texas, New Mexico, they never really had it. I mean, things stayed pretty doggone good out there, and, and they were certainly profitable. So we're, our, our cap on growth in the Intermountain region is not so much for repopulate or growth, is it just they didn't have to depopulate to have to grow. The North Plains deal with, with all the oil thing, who knows? You know, I've got them a 10% growth. I, when I would interview folks, I'd get comments both ways. Um, here's the area, and I, I saw from the slide, the intro, that I've got somebody from Georgia and somebody from Florida. Please don't whip me over this. Um, I, 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 spent some, I spent some time at a, at a program in, in North Carolina trying to get a handle on, on rebuilding. And they told me, said, look, here's what's happening here. Of all these people in the Northeast, the baby boomers that are retiring, a lot of them immediately retire to here. Well, the heat and the lifestyle both proved to be a little more dynamic than what they were looking for. So within three to five years, they moved back about halfway in, uh, not back to New England, but about halfway, and, and that's kind of a, a lifestyle in that North Carolina thing. Um, the population growth in that whole Southeast complex, the, the change in social expectations, uh, say excluding, excluding Florida and, and some of the, some of the uh, I don't think we'll see that, that cow rebuilding. Appalachia, kind of the same thing. Uh, so that leaves, and the 2% growth in the Northwest, honest to goodness, all I did there is I took a guy who has a corporate job and a weekend farm, or, or club calves, recreational farming. That's all I've done with that. Uh, it's not gonna, you know, there's no, no big deal. So that leaves the real growth in the Corn Belt. And I was using this slide at a presentation last week, and the question came up, so do you guys telling me that you're going to tear up, take row crop corn and bean ground and take it out of production, take the two years to put it back to grass and graze cows on $11,000 an acre farm ground? And uh, no, 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 no. That is not what we're saying whatsoever. We are saying that because of the need to diversify income and the ability to pull value out of those byproducts of corn stalks, corn silage, distillers products, that the increased efficiency of using those byproducts that off of conventional row crop production, that's what will enable that production. All right, one last point, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. So if you take this distribution scheme that I've come up with, um, you've got 11% uh, of your cows are in that Intermountain West region, um, only 5% in the West, um, that North Plains deal, only 8% of the cows are North and South Dakota, but 29% of the cows are in the Southwest, and 21% of the cows are in the Corn Belt. So we're looking to condense 
the area of cow-calf production inside the United States. And it puts us closer to the feed yards and the processors and all that stuff. Here's the lookout. It leaves us more vulnerable to the next time we have a drought. And again, Kenneth, you could have wrapped this whole thing up with your intro. You talked, you know, we're just one weather event away from the next drought, and I hope not, but true, it's gonna happen. So if we, if we line those cows up right through the center of the country, it, it could leave us more vulnerability or a more rapid turnover from contraction and expansion than what we've had historically. And, uh, Thank you, Don. Yep. Mm-hmm.